Hello everyone and welcome to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. We're glad you're tuned in. We want to give a shout out to our friends at Southern Oregon PBS, KTVL, KDRV, and the Dove Network. Thank you for hosting us on your station. In the Medford School District, we have one shared vision and that we believe that all are learning and learning is for all. And what better place to do that than right here on Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Hi, my name is Ivan Olinghaus, and I am a teacher over here at Hedrick Middle School. I teach electives, but today I'm going to go down a different path. I'm going to explore one of my favorite subjects in the whole wide world, literature, especially fantasy fiction. So here's a few fantasy fiction delights, just little teasers of them. For anybody out there who enjoys fantasy fiction, a lot of this literature is appropriate for about fifth grade and up. And by up, I mean like really old. All right, first off, I have Dealing with Dragons. Dealing with Dragons here, it's by P Patricia Reed. Uh, I'm gonna read to you the first chapter. When I open a new book, one of my favorite things is to look at the names of the chapters. And as I start going through these chapters in which Simmerine refuses to be proper and has a conversation with a frog, in which Simmerin discovers the value of a classical education and has some unwelcome visitors, in which Simmerin meets a witch and has doubts about a wizard. I love reading these types of chapters because they give me an idea or maybe a preview of what this book might be about. Without much further ado, chapter one, in which Simmerin refuses to be proper and has a conversation with a frog. Linderwall, was a large kingdom just east of the mountains of mourning where philosophers were highly respected and the number five was fashionable. The climate was unremarkable and the knights kept their armor brightly polished mainly for show. It had been centuries since a dragon had come east. There were the usual periodic problems with royal children and uninvited fairy godmothers but they were always the sort of thing that could be cleared up by finding the proper prince or princess to marry the unfortunate child a few years later. All in all, Linderwall was a very prosperous and pleasant place. Simmerin hated it. Simmerin was the youngest daughter of the king of Linderwall, and her parents found her rather trying. Her first, their first six daughters were perfectly normal princesses with long golden hair and sweet dispositions, dispositions more beautiful than the last. Simmerine was lovely enough, but her hair was jet black and she wore it in braids instead of curled and pinned like her sisters. And she wouldn't stop growing. Her parents were quite sure that no prince would want to marry a girl who could look him in the eye instead of gazing up at him becomingly through her eyelashes. As for the girl's disposition, well, when people were being polite, they said she was strong-minded. And when they were angry or annoyed with her, they said that she was as stubborn as a pig. The king and queen did the best that they could. They hired the most superior tutors and governesses to teach Simmerine all the things a princess ought to know, dancing, embroidery, drawing, and etiquette. There was a great deal of etiquette, from the proper way to curtsy before a visiting prince to how loudly it was permissible to scream when being carried off by a giant. giant. <laughs> Linderwall still had an occasional problem with giants. Simmerine found it all very dull, but she pressed her lips together and learned it anyway. And when she couldn't stand it any longer, she would go down to the castle armory and bully the armsmaster into giving her a fencing lesson. As she got older, she found her regular lessons more and more boring. Consequently, the fencing lessons became more and more frequent. When she was 12, her father found out. Fencing is not proper behavior for a princess, he told her in the gentle but firm tone recommended by the court philosopher. Simmerine tilted her, her, tilted her head to one side and said, why not? Well, it's well, it's, it's simply not done. 
Simmering considered. Aren't I a princess? Well, yes, of course you are, my dear, said her father with relief. He had been bracing himself for a storm of tears, which was the way his other daughters reacted to reprimands. Well, well, I fence, Simmering said with the air of someone delivering an unshakable argument. So it is too done by a princess. That doesn't make it proper, dear, put in her mother gently. Why not? Well, it simply doesn't, the queen said firmly, and that was the end of Simmering's fencing lessons. When she was 14, her father discovered that she was making the court magician teach her magic. How long has this been going on? He asked wearily when she arrived in response to her summons. What well, since you stopped my fencing lessons, Simmerine said. I suppose you're going to tell me it isn't proper behavior for a princess. Well, yes, I mean, it isn't proper. Nothing interesting seems to be proper, Simmerine said. Well, you might think, let's see, this is her mother. You might find things more interesting if you applied yourself a little more, dear, Simmerine's mother said. I doubt it, Simmerine muttered, but she knew better than to argue when her mother used that tone of voice, and that was the end of the magic lessons. The same thing happened over the Latin lessons from the court philosopher, the cooking lessons from the castle chef, the economics lessons from the court treasurer, and the juggling lessons from the court minstrel. Simmerine began to grow rather tired of the whole business. When she was sixteen, Simmerine summoned her fairy godmother. Simmerine, my dear, this sort of thing really isn't done, the fairy said, fanning away the scented blue smoke that had accompanied her appearance. Oh, people keep telling me that, Simmerine said. Well, you should pay attention to them, then, her godmother said irritably. I'm not used to being hauled away from my tea without warning, and you aren't supposed to call me unless it is a matter of utmost importance to your life and future happiness. It is of utmost importance to my life and future happiness, Simmerine said. Oh, very well. You're a bit young to have fallen in love already. Still, you always have been a precocious child. Tell me about him. Simmerine sighed. Ah, it isn't a him. Enchanted, is he? The fairy said with a spark of interest. A, a frog, perhaps? That used to be quite popular, but it seems to have gone out of fashion lately. Nowadays, all the princesses are talking birds, or dogs, or hedgehogs. No, no, I'm not in love with anyone. What, then what exactly is your problem? The fairy said in exasperation. This, Simmering gestured at the, castle, at the castle around her, embroidery lessons, and dancing, and being a princess. My dear Simmering, the fairy said, shocked. It's your heritage. Well, it's boring. Boring? The fairy did not appear to believe what she was hearing. Boring. I want to do things, not sit around all day and listen to the court minstrel make up songs about how brave daddy is and how lovely his wife and daughters are. Nonsense, my dear. This is just a stage you're going through. You'll outgrow it soon, and you'll be very glad you didn't do anything rash. Simmering looked at her godmother suspiciously. You've been talking to my parents, haven't you? Well, they do try to keep me up to date on what my godchildren are doing. I thought so, said Simmering, and bade her fairy godmother a polite goodbye. So if you like the sound of Simmerine's kind of irreverent approach to being a princess, would like to check it out more, um, you might want to look for this book, Dealing with Dragons, by Patricia Reed. 
It has a wonderful uh, series of books that come after it. So you can be engrossed in this one for a long time. And one of the things that you'll find out is that she ends up running away, which maybe isn't the best choice in the world, but the adventures she has along the way, she learns a lot from. The next book that I want to show you is Westmark. Westmark is an old classic by a fellow named Lloyd Alexander, whose probably most famous book um, is the Perdain Chronicles. It's a set of five books. And the most famous of those five is the second one, I believe called The Black Cauldron, which was made into a movie a long time ago. Uh, Lloyd Alexander has this wonderful illustrative style of writing, and he really pulls the reader in. Um, in this particular book, we find ourselves in a land called Westmark, which sounds a lot like um, a fantasy fiction version of a colonial America while it's still under British rule. Um, and what they are experiencing is that the main character, Theo, is an apprentice in a print shop. So, or, or in, uh, he works for um, uh, a man who runs the press that actually literally is printing the letters um, onto the papers and things like that. So they are creating the media of the day um, until one day he gets an interruption into the shop while he's there by himself without his master. When he's still an apprentice, he gets an interruption from a very unusual character. One day in early spring, Anton, Theo's master, went out on business, leaving his apprentice in charge. Theo cleaned and sorted letter blocks, finished his other chores by the end of the afternoon, and was ready to close shop when a dwarf came strutting in like a gamecock. A riding coat swept to the little man's boot heels, an enormous cocked hat perched on the side of his head, and he stood, hat included, no higher than the middle button of Theo's jacket. In swagger, he took up more room than a half a dozen taller men. Theo was glad to see any size customer, but before he could wish him good day or ask him his business, the stranger went peering into the ink pots, rattling the wooden cases, fingering the stacks of paper, and squinting sidelong at the press. At last, he stopped, hooked his thumbs into his waistcoat, and declared in a voice, half bullfrog, half bass drum. Basket. Theo, bemused, could only stare. The dwarf snapped his fingers. Basket, that's my name. The dwarf shook his head impatiently, as if Theo should have known without being told, then waved a hand around the shop. You're the only printer, I suppose, in Upper Dismal or whatever you call this place. Sir, began Theo. To tell you the truth, don't. Well, what I mean is, I'm not the printer. I'm only his, his devil. A devil means apprentice. Well, you're a big one, then. I'll say that much for you, replied Musket. You'll do. You'll have to. The dwarf whipped off his hat, loosing a burst of ginger-colored hair, reached into it, and pulled out a number of closely written scraps of paper. He tossed them on the counter. The pages, from what Theo glimpsed, were the draft for some sort of tract or pamphlet. To be printed up, and nicely, no cheap jack work, is for Dr. Absalom. He's world famous. You've heard of him. Theo admitted he had not, adding that he had never been out of Dorning. The dwarf gave him a look of pity. A grown lad like you, and never away from this hole and corner. You aren't much in the swim of things, are you? Musket now turned his attention to the pamphlet. Tapping his thumb against his fingers, he began rattling off the number of copies, the size, the quality of the paper, the world-renowned Dr. Absalom insisted on. The little man was talking about more work than the shop had seen in a year. Theo began calculating in his head how much it would all come to, Musket sp spared him the trouble by offering his own price. A handsome one, better than handsome. Theo's heart sank at what he heard next. Need it tomorrow, said Musket. First thing. Tomorrow? We, we can't. There's not enough time. Take it or leave it. Tomorrow or not at all. The dwarf rocked back and forth on his heels. Theo's mind raced. He could not bring himself to turn down such a piece of business. 
With a master craftsman like Anton, the two of them working all night at top speed, it was possible, though barely so, but the decision was Anton's to make. Theo had never promised work on his own. What's it to be, then? demanded Musket. Well, you'll have it. By noon. The dwarf shot a finger at him. Nine. Theo choked a little. By nine. Done. Musket clapped on his hat and made for the door. I'll be here to fetch him. Theo had not a moment to waste. Anton would be overjoyed or furious at him for making promises he could not keep. From the first days of his apprenticeship, Anton had taught him that his word, once given, must be counted on. As soon as Musket had gone, Theo began studying the scraps of paper to see how best he could arrange his work. The next book I have for you is one that I discovered recently and have fallen in love with reading uh, with my uh, students. And this one is Keeper of the Lost City by Shannon Messenger. This is a wonderful story of a young girl who discovers she's maybe even more special than she thought. So in the middle of the first chapter here, we are introduced to Sophie. Sophie Foster is on a class field trip to a museum. And Sophie is no ordinary child. She's a genius. She knows so much more than all of her classmates. She skipped several grades and she has these extraordinary things that keep happening to her. Here we go. Across the museum, Sophie caught sight of the tall, dark-haired boy reading yesterday's newspaper with the embarrassing black and white photo of her on front. Then he looked up and stared straight at her. She'd never seen eyes that particular shade of blue before. Teal, like the smooth pieces of sea glass she'd found on the beach, and they were bright when they glittered. And they were so bright they glittered. Something flickered across his expression when he caught her gaze. Disappointment? Before she could decide what to make of it, he shrugged off the display he'd been leaning against and closed the distance between them. The smile he flashed belonged on a movie screen, and Sophie's heart did a weird, fluttery thing. Is this you? he asked, pointing to the picture. Sophie nodded, feeling tongue-tied. He was probably 15, and by far the cutest boy she'd ever seen. So why was he talking to her? I thought so. He squinted at the picture and then back at her. I didn't realize your eyes were brown. Uh, yeah, she said, not sure what to say. Why? He shrugged. No reason. Something felt off about the conversation, but she couldn't figure out what it was, and she couldn't place his accent. Kind of British, but somehow different. Crisper? Which bothered her but she didn't know why. Are you in this class? She asked, wishing she could suck the words back as soon as they left her mouth. Of course he wasn't in her class. She'd never seen him before. She wasn't used to talking to boys, especially cute boys, and it made her brain a little mushy. His perfect smile returned as he told her. No. Then he pointed to the hulking greenish figure they were standing in front of, an Albertosaurus in all its giant lizard glory. Tell me something. Do you really think that's what they looked like? It's a little absurd, isn't it? Not really, Sophie said, trying to see what he saw. It looked like a small T-Rex, big mouth, sharp teeth, ridiculously short arms. Seemed fine to her. Why? What do you think they look like? He laughed. <laughs> Never mind. I'll let you get back to your class. It was nice to meet you, Sophie. He turned to leave just as two classes of kindergartners barreled into the fossil exhibit. The crushing wave of screaming voices was enough to knock Sophie back a step, but their mental voices were a whole other realm of pain. Kids' thoughts were stinging high-pitched needles, and so many at once was like an angry porcupine attacking her brain. Sophie closed her eyes as her hands darted to her head, rubbing her temples to ease the stabbings in her skull. 
Then she remembered she wasn't alone. She glanced around to see if anyone noticed her reaction and locked eyes with the boy. His hands were at his forehead and his face wore the same pained expression she'd imagined just a few seconds before. Did you just hear that? He asked, his voice hushed. She felt the blood drain from her face. He couldn't mean. It had to be the screaming kids. They created plenty of racket on their own, shrieks and squeals and giggles, plus 60 or so individual voices chattering away. Voices. She gasped and took another step back as her brain solved her earlier problem. She could hear the thoughts of everyone in the room, but she couldn't hear the boy's distinct accented voice unless he was speaking. His mind was totally and completely silent. She didn't know that was possible. Who are you? She whispered. His eyes widened. You did, did it you? He moved closer, leaning in to whisper. Are you a telepath? She flinched. The word made her skin itch and her reaction gave her away. You are, I can't believe it, he whispered. Sophie backed towards the exit. She wasn't about to reveal her secret to a total stranger. It's okay, he said, holding out his hands as he moved closer like she was some sort of wild animal he was trying to calm. You don't have to be afraid. I'm one too. Sophie froze. My name is Fitz, he added, stepping closer still. Fitz? What kind of a name was Fitz? She studied his face, searching for some sign that this was all part of a joke. I'm not joking, he said, like he knew exactly what she was thinking. Maybe he did. She wobbled on her feet. She'd spent the past seven years wishing she could find someone else like her, someone who could do what she could. Now that she'd found him, she felt like the world had tilted sideways. He grabbed her arms to steady her. It's, it's okay, Sophie. I'm here to help you. We've been looking for you for 12 years. 12 years? That's what, what did he mean by we? Better question. What did he want with her? The walls closed in and the room started to spin. Air. She needed air. She jerked away and bolted through the door, stumbling as her shaky legs found the rhythm. She sucked in giant breaths as she ran down the stairs in front of the museum. The smoke from the fires burned her lungs, and white bits of ash flew in her face, but she ignored them. She wanted as much space between her and the strange boy as possible. Sophie, come back! Fitz shouted behind her. She picked up her pace and she raced through the courtyard at the base of the steps, past the wide fountain and over the grassy knolls to the sidewalk. No one got in her way. Everyone was inside because of the poor air quality from the fires, but she could still hear his footsteps gaining on her. Wait, Fitz called. You don't have to be afraid. She ignored him, pouring all her energy into her sprint and fighting the urge to glance over her shoulder to see how far back he was. She made it halfway through a sidewalk before the sound of screeching tires reminded her she hadn't looked both ways. Her head turned and she locked eyes with a terrified driver struggling to stop his car before it plowed right over her. She was going to die. If you like cliffhangers, you're really going to enjoy this book, Keeper of the Lost Cities. There are some wonderful options. If you're just looking for something big to get lost in, a book that will extend all the way through summer, um, if you want, here's a few other options. Um, there's The Lightning Thief um, right here by Rick Riordan. This is book one of the Percy Jackson series, which is just an awesome, engrossing fantasy fiction world that's mixed and like merged with the uh, mythology of the Greeks. So if you're really into that kind of stuff, you might want to check out the Percy Jackson series. Another one that you probably have heard of, um, Harry Potter, another one of my favorites. Um, this is a great series. Gets a little darker by the time you get to the uh, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh uh, books. They're really geared towards older kids at that point, um, you know, middle school and beyond. 
Um, but the first two or three, um, they're pretty great for um, uh, all the way down through fifth grade and whatnot. If you're interested or looking for a good book, um, Harry Potter certainly will, will do that. Um, and then, of course, I can't go on anything about books without talking about my all-time favorite book in the whole wide world. And it's actually just not one book. It's a series of books. And that would be J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, which is what really inspired this picture behind me. I love this part of the woods where you can find a big tree stump and the roots and like maybe a hollow that you could hide in. It reminds me of the part in The Fellowship of the Rings that I'm about to read to you. The Fellowship of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien is an epic tale that has so much backstory to it, you can get lost in this world for years, literally. This particular book has spawned movies, ideas, poetry, music. So much has come from the art that is in this book. There's one real special moment in this book though, and it's a bumper sticker kind of moment. And what I mean by that is that there's a moment that has been taken out of this book and plastered on bumper stickers everywhere because it was that good. And I'm gonna read that moment to you. This is a part in the book where a hobbit named Frodo, along with his companions, have met a stranger in an inn and the stranger has handed them a letter from the hobbit's dear friend, Gandalf, who happens to be a wizard. Here's how the letter goes. The prancing pony, Bree, Midyear's Day, Shire Year 1418. Dear Frodo, bad news has reached me here. I must go off at once. You had better leave Bag End soon and get out of the Shire before the end of July at latest. I will return as soon as I can, and I will follow you. If I find that you are gone, leave a message for me here. If you pass through Bree, you can trust the landlord, Butterbur. You may meet a friend of mine on the road, a man, lean, dark, tall, by some called Strider. He knows our business and will help you. Make for Rivendell. There I hope we will meet again. If I do not come, Elrond will advise you. Yours in haste, Gandalf. P.S. Do not use it again. For any reason whatever, do not travel by night. P.P.S. Make sure that it is the real Strider. There are many strange men on the road. His true name is Aragorn. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. PPPS. I hope Butterbur sends this promptly. A worthy man, but his memory is like a lumber room. Thing wanted always buried. If he forgets, I shall roast him. Farewell. I love Gandalf's words in that particular moment. J.R.R. Tolkien uses that as a mouthpiece, and I find them very comforting, even in the times we are in now. All that is gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither, deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken, and a light from the shadows shall spring. Those are comforting words. I hope you enjoyed this little examination of fantasy fiction, and I hope you find yourself a wonderful book that you can use to curl up in your own little special place, wherever that may be, even if it's in your imagination or in the depths of a book.
for everyone here at Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Thanks.